Hi, Lauren, how are you? Excellent, Dr. Maisel, welcome, how are you? I'm good, Eric, please, make it Eric. I will make it Dr. E. Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Eric is great, it's great. Thank you so much for hopping on here. Of it's course. So cool to meet you. Good to meet you, you have a nice, is that a fireplace behind you? It is. Yeah, nice stone thing, looks like you're in medieval times. A stone thing, indeed, indeed. You know, you have so many fabulous books that have helped so many people. It made me wonder, how did you get started in this work? What was so important? What resonated with you as a writer yourself? Oh, that invites a very long answer. Let me go all the way back. So I was born right after World War II. And in my neighborhood, my Brooklyn neighborhood, it was made up of you know Jews and Italians and Irish. And World War II was the thing on their minds, the thing they had just lived through. And the idea of being a resistance fighter inculcated me way back when something about that as an image or an identity struck me as important. And I think that's part of the reason I've been doing all of these books is I'm resisting something, <laughs> resisting humbug, resisting what's conventional, resisting the untruths in putting together a lecture series at an inter internship I had when I was a family therapist intern. I invited people who I thought maybe knew something about artists' issues. This was in the San Francisco Bay Area. I thought there'd be a lot of people who understood about artist issues. And I invited in art therapists and these kinds of, I didn't know who, I didn't know what these categories were exactly or who anybody was. But what I began to discern was that they weren't actually speaking about the real challenges of being a creative person. They were talking about other things, sometimes interesting things, but not that. So I think that's when, this is, I'm not sure how long ago, 40 years ago, some number of years ago, um, when I began to see that if I was gonna be a therapist, I had an automatic and enjoyable niche in working with artists. Quickly, I realized I didn't like the therapy model. I didn't believe that I was diagnosing <laughs> and treating mental disorders. I didn't believe in the model, still don't. Mm. And so I segued. First, I called myself a creativity consultant because coaching wasn't a thing back then. And then I identified myself as a creativity coach. And I just continue to be fascinated by our life, the creative person's life, the challenges of it, just being supportive of people who do not receive much support in in this culture or mostly in any culture that's fabulous absolutely fabulous that wasn't very long an answer <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I could have included elementary school but i didn't <laughs> i knew another professor who had topics and every time he decided to tell one he'd say okay well this is my 40 minute topic and he would just go uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's what i was almost anticipating <laughs> that's right Playing, playing, playing those, playing those tapes. Yep. Fill us, fill us up with the great stuff. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you know, in 2006, I think it was when I saw Toxic Criticism in a mm -hmm. bookstore, and I was like, okay, I have to buy this. <laughs> yeah. Just a, even a quick glance, I was just amazed that you were coining the phrases so well. You were just nailing it. It was like, this is what I need. This is what's going to be helpful to me. And just to just to play off that, um, it is still the case that virtually every client I work with, every creative or performing artist, fears criticism way more than they should by now have understood they should fear it. But right. they do. They do. And as you know, uh, one bad report uh, destroys twenty good reports. It doesn't, matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many people liked your performance if somebody said you missed a note that that's that's the end of your good day and that's interesting that's interesting that we're built that way and i try to convince clients that they have to do a much better job of not caring about other people's opinions right and and what are some of the things for the folks who haven't read this book that helps folks get their mind adjusted properly to understand that like what did you find why are we wired that way I don't know why we're wired that way, but I know that the the antidote or the solution is to remember that we have to take personal responsibility for our thoughts and only think thoughts that serve us. 
the solution is cognitive. I mean, there's a body component too. It has, we have to understand what it feels like in our body to be criticized and how to grow a thicker skin and all of those ideas. But the main solution is to get this idea of only thinking thoughts that serve. Mm. Because there are many true thoughts that don't serve. It's exactly. not about truth and falsity. And, and it takes a moment for a person, for a client to get this idea. To take one example, you walk into a bookstore and you you say to yourself, wow, there are a lot of writers. That's a true statement, but it's not a useful statement. It's not a thought that serves you. <laughs> same same way, if if you say to yourself, um, I, I missed three notes in that sonata, that may be a true thought, but it's not a thought that serves you. If you, have to, you have to immediately dispute that thought, not about its veracity. It's true. Maybe you missed those three notes, but as to whether it's, any, it's good for you or not to be thinking that. When people get this idea that the Buddha said, get a grip on your mind, when people get the idea that they can get a better grip on their mind, that helps them enormously, comma. And then I did a book called Redesign Your Mind recently, which is which is interesting because it occurred to me at some point that it's one thing to arm wrestle thoughts to the ground, keep arm wrestling thoughts <laughs> and thinking thoughts that serve you. That's all good. But wouldn't it be lovely to change the source of your thoughts so that you didn't even have the thoughts that you didn't want? Mm. And so that's what that book is about, Redesign Your Mind. It's the idea of visualizing your mind as a room and changing, re redecorating it, redesigning it, changing it so that it's the room you want to be in which includes things like, you know, if you're a little sad, it might be painting painting the, the walls in a Navajo white or something. It might be mm -hmm. installing, installing windows so that a breeze blows through and getting some of those stuffy thoughts out of your head. In other words, different different kinds of visualizations that, oh, the main thing is getting that bed of nails out there that most people are sleeping on and putting <laughs> an easy chair, get an easy chair in there. Why not? Why not have our mind be an easier place, a friendlier place? I heard you doing an interview about that recently. Well, yeah, like like eight, ten months ago, and and you were saying, okay, everybody's got their happy place that they're told to go to, but when are you going to redecorate it? Why don't you put it in, in a relief switch? And why don't you put in a window? And why don't you? I was like, oh my god, right. I never thought of that. That's, That's right. And it's not for most people, it's not a happy place. No, it's not it's a happy place. <laughs> most people are pestering themselves a lot about life, and this, life is hard, and lots is going on that that we're not happy about. So it's not that easy to talk ourselves into that position of, of optimism and hope and those other things that uh, existential coaches and existential therapists say are more, <laughs> important than, more important than insight. Hope is more important than insight. Right. I can remember feeling like just because a thought is passing by doesn't mean it's mine. You know, like I don't have to take in that thought. I can just let it go by. That's right. There's a branch of psychology called psychos psychosynthesis, and it was founded by an Italian, Asagioli, and it, its basic premise is, is disidentification, and it's what you just said. It's hmm. that you, the person, have this core of perfection, this this beautiful soul, et cetera, et cetera, and you're not the temporal things that happen. And so if you get this idea down pat, then you never make the mistake of moving from I had a bad performance too. I'm a bad performer. You you mm. never you never identify yourself with the performance ever again. And once you can do that, if you have a bad performance, you have a bad performance. As long as you're still perfectly okay, then you're still perfectly okay. <laughs> it was like that uh, saying I had heard when I was in college: if you want to paint the perfect picture, make yourself perfect and paint naturally. And I was like, what the heck does what? that? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, which 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 brings us to the question of mistakes and messes and and dealing with the reality of process. Mm. An awful lot of people. Everybody pays lip service to, I love the process, but most people don't really <laughs> love the creative process. If, if not it, even you, I do. But I, I do but love I, it. But, I, but, I, but, I, but I'm easy with mistakes and messes and things not working and. And not knowing. I'm okay with not knowing. Like, I don't even know what I'm making. And not knowing. That's right. And for a songwriter, I think it's slightly different, let's say, from a novelist in the sense that the investment in a song might be days. For a novelist, it might be two years of doing something that doesn't work. Right. And that doesn't feel good. It's not, it's not, I'm not saying that these, these are good feeling things to spend two years on a book that doesn't work. No. 
or have seven incomplete songs. Or none of these things feel good, but that's the process. Yes. And in making an album for me, if I'm writing, playing most of the parts myself, or even inviting friends that take time to come over or send me parts, I'm recording it all myself, mixing it all myself, producing yep. it all, arranging it all. It'll take a good year, sometimes longer. That's right. So, so there's that kind of investment in that. Yeah. And, and does it all hang together and... That's what right. Was I thinking, <laughs> then, you know, we're we're interesting creatures in that we want two things simultaneously. We want at least what we do to be good, but actually we want it to be excellent. We want it to be great. Mm. So there's this dynamic tension between good and great. A lot of people who do good work are not satisfied because it's not great. Mm. I try to invite clients to accept their good stuff as good. Let let good be good. Let the celebrate good. I mean, great is great, but celebrate good. How many of box cantatas are great? Nine of 163 or whatever the numbers are, or how many of Bob Dylan's songs are great? 27 of 762, whatever the numbers are, it's always a percentage, <laughs> it's always a percentage of the whole. <laughs> and we have to be okay with with our excellent work being only a percentage of the whole. If we kind of need a guarantee that it's going to be excellent, we're not going to get any work done. And I like that we're new every day and there's a new mm -hmm. chance and a clean slate and a new way to go about it, but also maybe even more learning has taken place. So I could easily look back and say, I can do better now, but it doesn't mean I have to undo everything I've ever done or not release it to wait for that to be excellent That's because right. the next and thing can be addressed. That's right. And for successful artists, there's the constraint that their audience wants them to both repeat themselves and top themselves simultaneously, which is one of those <laughs> absurd things but they they want you to play your hits and also your new hits yeah and so the idea that you're new each day is a little harder i think for the very successful artist actually because that person is stuck with a repertoire or what have you mm. that their audience demands I'll give you a great example of this it's, it's arthur conan doyle mm. he hated how successful sherlock holmes was he just hated it because <laughs> nobody was reading his novels. They only wanted Sherlock Holmes. So what does he do? He kills Sherlock Holmes, right? He pushes him <laughs> off the cliff. I remember that. <laughs> his fans are so outraged that they demand that Sherlock Holmes... And so in the next episode, Arthur Conan Doyle has to say, oh, wait, he only tripped and got caught on a branch and he's still alive. And <laughs> that's how we want to kill off our successes when they're, when they're holding us hostage. Wow. It's interesting. So even, so even even success is its own interesting dilemma. And I've never liked when they say a director and a filmmaker have gotten together and they've made this masterpiece, but now they're going to test it on a bunch of test audiences and see what ending they want. It's like, it, people what? want to write by committee. That's right. <laughs> you know, I don't really care if that's the way they wanted it to go. This was my vision. This is that's what right. I wanted to do. Well, the, the the producers are saying we're not going to give you the final check unless you do it this way. <laughs> so I have been very lucky in my life then. <laughs> I've had total creative freedom. <laughs> That's right. That that is that is luck because if we're embedded in some system where there are money folks determining things, um, that's its own pressure and challenge. Yeah, it's its own can of worms. Yep. One of the things you say in many of your books that I just absolutely love is that an artist needs to make meaning every day. It, that's an invitation to another long answer, but it won't be the, it won't be the 40 minute one, but it'll, <laughs> it'll, it has to be longish because I do invite folks to make the paradigm shift from seeking meaning to making meaning. Mm. We have the several thousand year old metaphor or idea that meaning's out there somewhere it's it's in india or top of a mountain or at some guru's feet or in some bible or someplace but it's out there <laughs> it's time for us to let go of the idea that meaning's out there and to understand that it's merely a subjective psychological experience mm. and that's a mouthful because they have to sort of unpack those words it's only a feeling and as a feeling it comes and goes people who want life to feel meaningful at all times are making a mental mistake they wouldn't want they wouldn't expect life to feel angry at all times or joyful at all times or anything right. at all times but somehow they think that life is supposed to feel meaningful at all times wrong it comes and goes and when it goes it doesn't feel good it's one it's a peculiar feeling where the absence of it really annoys us 
and we call it meaninglessness, and it's a bad thing. We don't mm. like. We can't literally make meaning, but we can try to coax meaning into existence because we're not in charge of it. We can't really make it. We can't guarantee that we're going to have the experience of meaningfulness by working on a song or by performing. Some sometimes the performance feels meaningful, other times it's sort of drudgery. <laughs> So all we can do, all we can do is try to coax meaning into existence. And I think the main way we do that is by doing things we've experienced as meaningful before, a very straightforward idea. But we have to kind of notice what actually felt meaningful before. It's like we need a list <laughs> or a menu yeah. of things, because you'll discover, people discover that their whole PhD program wasn't meaningful. <laughs> you know, they thought it would be, but it wasn't. But talking to their Aunt Rose about family secrets, that was super meaningful. So once we get us, or holding your kid's hand crossing the street is what's meaningful, or, or mm. whatever it may be. So getting a better sense of what actually has felt meaningful to us, and then doing it again, trying it again, again, without a guarantee, but with some hope that since it once felt meaningful, it might again. This is the idea of making meaning. It's not like you can actually construct it, or you can't. Hesse had a good sentence that's something like, you can't force life to mean. And you can't force life to mean, but you can try things that <laughs> encourage life to mean. <laughs> you can make it, in, in my language, you can make meaning investments. You, could, you can put your human capital into things. Mm. And you can try to seize meaning opportunities. You can try new things that you have as some in, inclination, in, some insight or some intuition might prove meaningful. So those are ways to try to coax meaning into existence. The, the headline is, as you're doing something, don't need it to feel meaningful. Hmm. Let go of that whole idea that, that because, because I'm doing my real work, it should feel meaningful. How could it not? <laughs> I'm doing exactly the thing I've always meant to do. How could it not feel meaningful? It's, because it may not. Because it may not. Because it may not. <laughs> The two examples you gave, though, sounded like very personal connections. The the, the Aunt Rose one and the <laughs> crossing and, the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's paying right. Attention, paying attention to some personal connection with someone you love. A absolutely. I think, and as a slight segue, there's one kind of would-be creative person or creative person who doesn't get to her work often enough. There's that person. But then there's the obsessed creative who only wants to live for for their art. <laughs> and they have their own problems. The Van Goghs of the world, even if they're very productive, still commit suicide. They don't, their life is not all together. So I try to suggest to all clients that they keep this create and relate mantra in their head somewhere, that it's important to get your creative work done, but it's very important to relate to other human beings or else life feels too cold and too empty. That's and it, there's, there's a kind of person who doesn't like other people very much and who who doesn't really want to interact with other people. Even, hmm. that, person, even that person needs an intimate other. Yes. It's <laughs> a cute example of this dynamic or this dilemma is, is Van Gogh who you may remember or you may know, when he moved to Provence, the first thing he does is buy like eight or 10 or a dozen huge armchairs for the salon he's going to run. <laughs> he's going to build community. He doesn't like anybody. <laughs> and, and of course, he does not build any community. But there, <laughs> there's, the, there's how the tension of wanting community plays out in an actual human being. You buy all these chairs for community, then they're just furniture. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> How much of, you, of that discombobulation that an artist feels is not meeting their own physical needs and their own thoughts? You know, like it, it feels like it's so easy to get out of balance with yourself if you're neglecting your food, your water, your sleep. You know, it's like those are pretty basic. But then how you think is so. Yeah. It's it's hanging in the balance of those things. And people don't realize all, that's, that's the right. reason that life feels horrible today. That's right. All of that is important. People, there's a there's an epidemic for everything, but there's an insomnia epidemic. <laughs> 80 million, 90 million Americans are having trouble sleeping. The two kinds of insomnia, there's the can't get to sleep, but then there's also falling asleep and abruptly waking up. There's that insomnia. Mm. 
people are anxious. They have things on their minds. They're worried about things. That's mm. a huge part of the insomnia epidemic is just our current anxiety levels. Let me connect up some ideas here. So I did a book called Sleep Thinking, and the idea of it is, an, is a solid, interesting idea that while we dream while we sleep, which everybody understands, most people don't understand that we also think while we sleep. We, we dream in REM sleep. We think in non-REM sleep. Our brain's busy all night long in one place or the other, thinking, mm -hmm. dreaming. And if you wake a songwriter up in, in non-REM sleep, she'll be writing a song. That's what we do as creative people or as thinking people or solving some problem or it's our problem solving time. Mm. Most creatives don't know that they have this free creative time available to them. If only they would turn to their creative work first thing each morning. Love that. If you go to bed with what I call a sleep thinking prompt, that is some wonder, like I, I wonder what my song about apples is about or something <laughs> and just allow your brain to work on that. If you're lucky, it doesn't happen every time, but if you're lucky, when you wake up, you can just take dictation because your your brain will have produced the song during wow. the night. For people who don't know to use this, they're losing 90 minutes or 120 minutes of free creative time every night by turning to the new day. The second you turn to the second you make that question about do I want a bagel or brown flakes, you're done. <laughs> Sleep thinking's done. It's gone. You, you've you've awakened. You've awakened mm. a new day, and you've lost that dreamy stuff that you had available to you. So, to just to re-say this loop, if a if a person who's having trouble sleeping tries this, this is actually a sleep aid because you go to a deeper by having that sleep thinking prompt by asking yourself a real question. You actually sleep better. A lot of clients think it's going to be the opposite. Well, I've I've set my brain to work, isn't that I'm I'm going to be jangly and wide awake? No, it actually it actually settles you hmm. to have your brain working on something important during the night. So part of the answer to the question of how to sleep better is to actually decide to think about something useful during the night and then turn to your real work first thing. I love that. Also, parenthetically existentially that's smart because by having done something real first thing you've made some meaning on that day already the rest of the day can be half meaningless and you don't have to get depressed <laughs> and you you'll actually some, feel good <laughs> yeah you've built some meaning capital by virtue yeah. of doing something real first people try to do it the other way around maybe i'll get to my creative work maybe i'll get to my creative work by the end of the day they have no brain cells left they're too tired and they're a little sad by the end of the day by virtue of not having gotten to their real work they're Indeed. a little down yeah Whereas, uh, whereas, you're like on top of the world when you've connected with your work. You can even you can even do something one of those tedious things like you know try to be in touch with the IRS or something after, you know after getting some real work done. You're, you're more prepared to do to do exactly. the, the odious tasks. If you just if it's just a day of odious tasks, that doesn't feel very good. No, no, never. You know there was that story of uh, a graduating class where they had a big container and the whole point was put your big rocks in first and is That's it full, right? right? And, right. And, and your real work, the thing that brings you most alive are your big rocks, the people that you love the most. Those are your big rocks. These are That's the right. things. And just, and just some tendrils of anxiety prevent people from doing that. It's not big mm. anxiety, just enough. So why? Mm. why, why is there so much anxiety threading through the creative process yeah. I think there, I think there are a lot of reasons, but but there one is just going on into the unknown is actually a little scary for folks. They don't quite understand it, but it is. Yeah. But the biggest one is the one they have no idea about, and they get it the second I say it, but they haven't thought about it. And that is that the creative process is essentially one choice after another. Yes, an A note or an F note, or put send my character to Barcelona or send my character to Paris. One choice after another, and choosing provokes mm -hmm. anxiety. So, and the number one thing we do to to prevent ourselves from feel, feeling that anxiety is to flee the encounter. We get the heck out of there. <laughs> that's, what, that's the number one thing we do to avoid anxiety. So people are are fleeing the encounter of choosing <laughs> all day long without knowing that that's why they're not getting to their work. Wow. The, the, that makes sense. 
it, it, it makes sense and it's the truth, but people don't know that that's what's happening. They, they, they've, never, they've not had this construct of, gee, I'm not getting to my novel just because I don't really want to decide whether to send her here or there. I just don't know what the next sentence is about and I'm going to have to make a choice. And uh, mm. I'm scared of making that choice because then I've locked seven words in place. And what if I made the wrong choice? And <laughs> it's, so it's about choosing, but it's also about wrong choosing. It's about the threat of choosing. Mm. But you People, almost can't get to that next choice until, until you've made that choice. No, and I call it wholehearted provisional commitment. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning good. you want to you want to write that sentence, you know, and, uh, and you want to get behind it at the same time. You don't know if it's the right sentence. Yeah, but so, you've got to get one foot forward somehow. You've got and, to. Yes, that's right. You've got to you've got to make those commitments and those choices. Then you get that thing called a draft at the end of all of that, and then you get to see what you've wrought, whether it's alive or dead. It may be dead. Dead as a doornail. It may be. <laughs> then becomes, this is your body of work. It becomes one of those things you take off the shelf and put in the garbage. Okay. <laughs> Deadhead the flower. <laughs> I mean, we have to be mature enough to understand that some things won't work and <laughs> we have to be okay with that. I've always known that even in a simple production, when you finish a song and get the real recording together, there's been thousands of decisions to get that right, especially if you're wearing all the hats because That's you're right. in all those different aspects as the arranger, as the producer, as the writer, as the singer, as the player, is this the right bass part? Do I want this sound on the voice? Should I put this reverb and, on? That's right. And, and often there are competing criteria and it's hard to make decisions when they're competing criteria. For instance, I have a client who wants to do a certain kind of music and she could do it as a sort of a, pink martini sized orchestra or a, a trio it hmm. could be it could be 10 pieces or three pieces and there are arguments on both sides the 10 she actually likes the sound of the 10 piece but but to get 10 players together blah 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 but you could we could speak to the to the two sides here but until you decide all you've got is the problem yes <laughs> and and it's not going to be a perfect solution because if she goes for the 10 piece, then then it's harder to put together than if she were to do the restricted trio, mm. et cetera. So we end up feeling a little dissatisfied with our own decisions because we have lost something mm. in the decisions. And that's part of maturity also is that we may get X percent of what we're hoping for, but we've also lost Y percent by making that choice. Always, always yep. though. Yep. I would suggest to her to, to do both. <laughs> and if she can't afford it for real people, do it up with the MIDI options we all have and then see which one she likes and then grab the yeah, right. Yeah, but that, that butts up against the question of time and energy. Nah. It, it butts up against that because she also has it like so many, she has a day an, an on, onerous day job, and et cetera, et cetera. So mm. that, that would typically be a good answer for a lot of things, do both. But I know working with clients, we have to do one. We have to choose mm. and 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 a little bit grieve. One of the things that I suggest to clients, I'm going to use my hands here, but is that they have a primary creative project. That's This is five days a week. Okay. And then if they have a secondary thing they want to do, turn over a half day Saturday to that. At least that way, the secondary thing gets some life and some time and some attention. Because it's too hard to get two real things done in the same day in most people's real lives. It's too hard to work on your novel and work on your symphony on the same day. Hmm. The brain doesn't really like to do that, and we don't have enough time for that. So in this model, you work on your novel for five days, then you give yourself a sleep thinking prompt on the Friday evening, like, what does my symphony want to be about? And then you turn to the symphony. And that way, over time, you get to work on multiple projects. Most people who are trying to work on multiple projects get nothing finished. Huh. And I know that's not your experience because you finish things, but a lot of people, mm. I think I saw a number recently that 90% of writers who start novels don't finish them. Wow. So th this, 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 this completing problem is actually a very big problem for an awful lot of creatives. Mm. And sometimes they'll say, I love so many things that, I don't know what to work on, but that always sounds a little funny because if you hmm. love that, work on one, work on something you love. Pick something and, today. And enjoy that. 
Yeah, yeah. Don't you think that some of them sound like just the rhetoric of what they're used to saying and their excuses? Like they, they, they're really not working at trying to get out of the right. circle of circles. That's uh, right. Complaints. They are. They are. Th th their excuses born from, from my point of view, anxiety, not from hmm. being a uncreative person or. Let me segue to another place that connects up here. Most people don't realize that they've had their imagination ruined over right. time by, by school and, and family and yeah. church and everything. 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 <laughs> they, don't, they, don't, they don't realize that. And so uh, it's very poignant when a poet with an MFA in poetry will come in to see me. How how can I not have an how can I not have an idea for a poem? <laughs> I've read a, read a million poems, love thousands of them, have my <laughs> MFA. How can I, my response is always problem with imagination over time. You got a little squashed imaginatively, and now you have to reclaim your imagination, which is an interesting task. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you rec how does one reclaim imagination? My metaphor is to get quiet and walk around the lake. It's really to just be open yeah. to ideas, to let ideas uh, percolate up, and of course to show up to the work. Tchaikovsky has a quote I love, which is, I, "I'm inspired every fifth day, but I only get that fifth day if I show up the other four. Right. And, right. and so, for a poet or anybody who wants to be inspired, they first have to engaged in daily practice from my point of view. They have to start doing the work day mm. in and day out. But they also have to understand that they've lost this facility to imagine. It happens, any any three-year-old, any four-year-old, you ask them, make a, make a salmon-shaped sc skyscraper, they'll do it. They'll <laughs> ask, start to ask a seven or eight or nine-year-old and they'll, the, the, salmon, the salmon needs to stay over there and the skyscraper needs to stay over there. And they're, they're starting to be that person who has to keep things in, draw within the lines. They're starting to be that person who needs to know what's on the test and draw within the lines and be safe and be conventional and be that person. Wow. So there's a whole recovery, an individual, individualistic recovery process needed for many creatives to regain their ability to imagine. It feels risky to imagine for a lot of people. They were told it was wrong. From a they were told it was wrong. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. they were told, and they were also told to um, shut up. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And so now they. But by the way, in terms of being told to shut up, in in the redesign your mind book, I'd like to include a speaker's corner, like in Hyde Park in London. You may or may not know that spot, but for hundreds of years, folks have been able to say whatever they want in that one spot in Hyde Park without reprising. Oh, right. So that was their speaker's corner where, where you had real free speech, you know. So I invite people to to create a speaker's corner in their redesigned mind where they can at least speak their truth to themselves. Whether yeah. to put it out in the world is another question. That's a safety issue. And that that's a different question. But at least we should be able to tell our truth to ourselves and have an internal speaker's corner where we get to Absolutely. speak our truth. And and getting it down, getting it out of your brain. Like I like keeping a, a, a journal. Yep. Since I'm 14 years old, I've written down nearly every day or at least highlights from 24 years old on. And it's so helpful to just do that brain dump. It is really helpful, comma. And I have to carefully advise clients who are used to starting their day doing journaling or morning page, Julia Cameron's morning pages to see if they've been prevented from writing their book by doing all of this journaling and morning pages. Yeah, I don't do it in the morning. Not to be a, <laughs> that kind of writing shouldn't be a substitute for the book. That, it, it's, that writing is great. Right. Now it needs to be like afternoon pages or evening pages so that you can get to your real work first thing. There are an awful lot of people with 20 or 30 or 50 or a thousand journals completed, but no book done yet. It's and true. You just have to be <laughs> careful about that. That's a good point. I find that there are so many things I enjoy doing first thing in the morning that yeah. I, I, I guess I have to decide sometimes maybe Mondays do this, Tuesdays do this, but then there's the idea of momentum. And once you've got something going, it's really that's hard right. to let it go. And I think that's one of the hardest things for a lot of my students is that they never felt 
the momentum kick in if they That's did right. this by accident. So they don't stick with something long enough to break through that little bit of resistance or that little bit of a, I always feel like it's like a, a veil or a, um, a yep. threshold of some sort. And I accidentally fell through it when I was 10 years old uh -huh. and wrote a song and didn't know how I got there, but it was the uh -huh. coolest magical room. And I thought, how do you get back here? This is amazing. That's right. And along those lines, I did a book called The Power of Daily Practice, which is about that, about getting to stuff every day. Nice. Building, building momentum. And one of the ideas in that book, it's a very, again, a very simple idea, but people don't get it till they hear it, or it's not on people's minds till they hear it. So for hundreds of years since the transcendental poets, we've had a particularly American thing of making progress. Mm. The idea of upward spiral, of always yeah. getting better and going, moving forward and went, went, taming the West and <laughs> progress, technology, progress. And creatives have to make the switch from needing to make progress in a daily way to just engaging in process, making the switch from progress to process. Yes. Because on a given day, you may not make progress. And if you're holding somewhere in the corner of your mind, the idea that if I'm not making progress, something's wrong, you have, to, you have to get rid of that idea that anything's wrong. There are days when you won't make progress and that's part of the process. So to say that simply, folks have to much better let go of the, of the, the need to be mm. making progress. Progress will come if you engage in the process. Absolutely. Because I think we incorrectly size up the project. We don't realize there's 27 steps to exactly something ready before that flow is going to happen. You know, it's like if you're getting ready for a trip. That's right. You've got a lot of packing to do and planning and what kind of snacks do we need and when will we make that first stop and how much will we bring and when are we coming back, but how long will it take us to get there? How many times should we stop for gas? Is these and like all you want to do is get on the road and listen to that book, you know? But That's it, right. you have to make these other just, choices just first. As, a, as an anecdote from a long time ago, I, when I was a first as a therapist, um, I worked with artist couples exclusively, which is one of the hardest things you can do as a human being because. <laughs> because the, the 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 elephant in the room always was who's who's going to have to work the bad day job and who gets to who, who has to make the money and who gets to do their art <laughs> do, do, the, do their art. Oh. And I, had little, I had a little little whiteboard that was not very big, where I would have to do the thing you just said, and that and that is help them identify how long things take. Mm. Get upset with each other about what wasn't being handled in the in the family system. I remember oh. one couple, an actor and a musician, they were so annoyed at each other because they could, neither one would take responsibility for fixing a broken window. <laughs> they couldn't get this window fixed because they thought that it would take the other person no time at all. So we broke it down to how long it would take. And it was like 12 hours because you have to like go to the big box store and get the glass and not know what you're doing and break the glass and go back and get another <laughs> Like get another piece of glass and you still don't know what you're doing. And it was like, take, take a week to fix. So I had to do that thing you just said, which, which was really help folks understand that things <laughs> take time and that there are multiple steps and that holding an intention has got to be followed by a plan, a nice solid plan. Mm. Intention is wonderful, but the plan better come next. <laughs> Yeah, it's like going down into the studio thinking, okay, I'm going to record that bass part. And you realize, oh, no, the, you've got to set the intonation on the bass. And you didn't know you were going to use the bass today, so it's not ready. And you didn't plug in such and such. And now this cable doesn't work. But why is there no signal? <laughs> you have to troubleshoot all this stuff. Or the computer decides to act up. And you need to update something. And you're like, I don't yep. want to do that right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Musici musicians have so many um, interesting, specific problems. It's really interesting. One is just having to get the notes right. I mean, in most, you know, if you're an abstract painter, if you dab yeah. in a little extra blue, who 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 will notice? You can, <laughs> you can just act like it was on purpose. But you know, in music, you actually have to get the notes pretty darn right. <laughs> Drop a note here or there. But basically, but that's an interesting problem of having to get things right in music, whereas you don't necessarily have to do that in some other metiers. So there's that. 
And there's another interesting one I find that many musicians, when they're just playing to themselves, playing music to themselves, hate how they sound. Mm. And that's because I've begun to understand that they're comparing themselves to produced music. Yes. The, the sound of just playing with yourself does not sound like produced music where you've had all of this work done on the sound. Right. And so the, it, it, musicians have to come to, again to another mature understanding of how I play here shouldn't have to sound like if seven producers and, and <laughs> all, all of those boards have been used to make something sound a certain way. Right. And it's why sometimes our famous artists, when we hear them live, don't sound as good as their recordings, because now they have to actually just do it rather than having this whole production apparatus. <laughs> And I've always liked just the sound of the record. I don't want to hear the sound of the venue I'm in and all the people around me. I, know mm -hmm. I want to hear just the music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have, have you heard that story where there was a Harvard businessman uh, on vacation in Mexico and he happens to notice a fisherman come back with two beautiful fish every day and he just stops fishing. And finally, after about three or four days, he stops the fisherman and says, Senor, Senor, why do you stop fishing? He says, well, I have the food for the day. Well, what are you going to do with the rest of the day? He's like, well, I'm going to go have siesta with my wife, and I'm going to go spend time with my kids, and I'm going to enjoy the beautiful day. And he says, but, senor, listen, I'm a businessman. <laughs> you would just spend a few more hours out there. You could catch more fish. And then what, senor? Well, you could sell those fish. Well, and then what, senor? Well, then you could get a bigger boat. And then you could start a cannery. And then it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. It's like, well, then what, senor? Well, then you could sell the company. Well, then you could be a millionaire. Well, then what, senor? It's like, well, then you could retire early to spend <laughs> time with your wife. <laughs> spend time exactly. with your kids if they haven't all grown up already. And <laughs> enjoy the day. So it's it's this crazy thing with artists that we're right. told, especially musicians and young students that I have, they all think, and I've had this problem myself for decades where you think, if I've not become famous for this, something yeah. that I'm so good at, it yeah. doesn't count. That's right. And and, and that, nobody that, knows that, who right. I am and, and all this kind of thing. Like, how do you, what, what kind of things do you tell people for that? Which of your books? Address I'm, not, I'm, not off, I'm not offhand sure which book, but what I, what I tell clients in that position is A, they have to define success for themselves and let go of idealistic or romantic or what have you notions of. I was just working with a musician today who was who was a symphony um, bassist. I guess that's the right instrument. I'm not sure if cello and bass are the same things. I'm not, I'm ignorant. No, you're correct with the first. Okay, so I, she was a, a, a symphony bassist who now um, is a real estate appraiser and gets to manage to do her music a few minutes every other day kind of thing. Well, mm. we've had to work on that being okay. She's trying yeah. to, you know, she's trying to create classical music, um, chamber music, and she can only do it every once in a while. And her job is is onerous, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So you have to work on the cognitive piece of this has to be okay. You have to enjoy that life somehow, find, find the ways to celebrate the successes True. Most people do no celebrating of their successes, You're except right. except at the highest level of you know winning an Academy Award or what have you. But in hmm. a day in and day out way, very few creatives will say, "Wow, I worked for twelve minutes. That's wonderful." <laughs> you know, they're going to say, "How how did I not work for two hours?" That's what they're going to say. <laughs> a lot of it has to do with recalibrating what success looks like and how to celebrate those things that we can celebrate because we, we have to do the celebrating. And I really think we get the essence of what we've always been after as well. I have a good friend, Dr. Kate Chadbourne from Harvard, and she says it's the essence that we get. And I always wanted a safe place of my own, mm -hmm. a home, single family home away from the other houses so I can play drums anytime I want and nobody yep. calls the cops and I have the woods and the quiet and my miniature dachshunds and yep. the freedom and the, you know, all these things, whatever it was, lists of things that I had hoped That's for. That's good thinking. life. That's right. That's the good life. It's not. Whatever. And thinking that I needed to be rich and famous before I could afford all that. Mm -hmm. And that was <laughs> untrue as well. Like I didn't think that could happen otherwise. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like 
realizing you've hit so many goals and you, who, you're who you wanted to be your whole life. You've been That's doing right. that your whole life and That's making right. that count and, and not having to prove that to anybody. Like my students in the beginning, especially, it's like if you're not on the cover of Rolling Stone, they're not interested in what you have to say. And so you, you can say something 15 times, but as soon as the guest artist comes and says it, they hear it. And That's part right. of that is they've heard it for the 15th time and now the 16th time it makes sense. And it, yep. it, you know, the synapse connections made and they realize the importance of what you've been saying all along and that the work is the same. But a lot of times they don't realize that that particular job as that famous person is a prison for some of them. They don't it's, employ it once they get it. it and they've worked so hard for and it. It's a prison and the first year of an artist's great success is is almost always the worst year of their life. <laughs> uh, suddenly, they're, everyone's offering them drugs. Everyone's offering them sex. Everyone now ha wants something from them. Oh my it's god! Completely discombobulating. I mean, I mean, great success. I don't mean a little success, but sure. that, that kind of celebrity success is is a, is an open door to disaster. And that. <laughs> That first year of a of a of an artist, whatever whatever genre, what best selling novelist, or whatever it's about, mm. that first year, it it it's completely confusing and discombobulating, and and most creative folks don't survive that first year very well, wow. and they also and it's why their next work is often terrible. Oh wow! Because they've been miserable that whole year. They've been miserable, and and they've lost their chops. They haven't been working. Now it's been drugs, and, sex, drugs, and but not rock and roll. It's just the sex and drugs, or, or, or just just dis, just distracted by offers and stuff, mm. stuff going on. The pull on them to wow. do one thing. So yes, um, of course we fantasize about success and and idealize success and romanticize success. But again, that's one of my jobs is just to normalize what the what the real life of creatives are mm. and to them. I, I did a book with a, an addiction specialist, a book called Creative Recovery, which I, I think is maybe the only recovery program for artists that's out there. And th this was one of the places we wanted to highlight was the particular challenges of early recovery for a creative person and how the energy of renewed ambition, suddenly you're sober, and now you want to do the stuff you haven't been doing, oh. but that flies <laughs> counter to the energy of first things first and easy does it and what have you. So there's 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 dynamic energy conflict mm. in recovery between, wow, I get to do all this stuff now. Oh no, I've got to go slow. So there's so many interesting tangled oh. dynamics in, in our lives. Wow. <laughs> I like also realizing that everything is made up even all the awards. Some people uh -huh. got together and said, let's celebrate such and such an achievement. Let's make this type of statue. And it's still made it up. There's this feeling since you're a kid that there's some kind of major right or wrong, or this is the true thing. Exactly. And somebody's going to tell you that you've finally hit it. Whereas it's totally an inside job. And you can That's give right. yourself and an award. <laughs> where my mind, where my mind goes, is about another made-up thing, and that's mental disorders. And that's one of my fields. Uh, I'm in the critical psychology and critical psychiatry world, where we don't believe that mental disorders are anything but labels, as as described by the American Psychiatric Association and its Bible. Yeah. And that's that, that's a mouthful and takes a lot of unpacking. But uh, day in and day out, I'm dealing with. The reality of kids, especially my particular interest is in how kids are being labeled with these mental disorder labels, ADHD, of course, particularly nowadays, yes. and put on powerful gateway chemicals that are leading to this opioid addiction, uh, opioid epidemic that everybody's talking about, but no one quite understanding how this diagnosis dash treatment thing is causing a lot of this um, addiction and problem so that's off to left off to the left of where we were but it's another labeling game and there I, are many many labeling games out there i'm so happy to hear you say that though because i feel like it's a mislabeling traumatic situation that everybody's in as well i mean even just a few years ago i had a student who started off the semester absolutely gung-ho full of vim and vigor 
very talented, very happy, very healthy. And as the semester progressed, he got less and less enthusiastic. He started to look more and more gaunt. His skin became a very strange color and he started looking like he was incredibly troubled. And yep. I said, every week I kept saying, what's going on, what's going on? Finally, one day he came in and he just looked so thin. I just said, what are you doing? What are you eating? Are you sleeping? I can't sleep, I can't sleep. What are you eating? He said, I've been trying. He said, my, my family has gotten me to the family psychiatrist and they've got me on drugs that don't work and I could get paralyzed from it. And, it, and it, it, all these things, all these things. But That's why, right. why did you go? Why did they have you see him? What's happening? Because I can't sleep. Why can't you sleep? What are you eating? He said, I've been trying to save money and I've been eating trail mix three times a day for weeks and weeks or months, mm -hmm. whatever it was. And yeah. I was like, are you absolutely kidding me? He's like, I said, take that $5, go to Trader Joe's, buy a package of chicken thighs and go home and eat them right after this lesson. Exactly. I said, there's nothing wrong with your brain. You don't have any resources. You're not giving yourself that's, that's any right. kind of fuel. And the fact that his own parents went to the so-called yeah. experts first and the expert didn't even say, are you sleeping? Are you eating well? You can no, just tell no. by looking they're, at him. They're, in, not... they're incurious about. They're incurious about what's going on. Oh. The, the average time that a new patient spends with a psychiatrist is fifteen minutes. Oh my God! What can go on there? Nothing can go on except the checklist thing. It, it's using the DSM, find, finding the so to speak diagnosis, which is just a label. It's, the DSM is a shopping catalog for psychiatrists and other mental health professionals. <laughs> oh my God. It's what it is. And, you know, I've done a million books on this subject and I, I'm the lead editor for the Ethics International Press Critical Psychology and Critical Psychiatry series. And we have we, we have whole books out on each of these. The last one that came out is Deconstructing ADHD. Um, this is my field. And it's it's uh, it's horrible what goes on. And if the treatment weren't chemicals, that'd be one thing. It'd be one thing if, if, the, mm. if the diagnoses were unreliable, just. just labels. If you're just labeling somebody, but then not doing anything to them, that'd be one thing. But it's in this case, enough. this mm -hmm. case, you label them, then you give them five or six or seven, eight chemicals. Oh my uh, God. It's all not okay, but that's a, it's a big subject. <laughs> But they believe these labels and they believe these experts, just like anybody learns to trust all these people around them. And you grow up to realize that half of them were crazy and didn't know yeah. what they were saying and they it, weren't offering it, to you. It meets, it meets people where they're at. They, they want an answer. And so this feels like a simple answer. Every second client I'm seeing now is saying I'm ADHD. Oh, this every is, second yeah. student, almost every student. Yeah, exactly. It's disturbing. I'm like, why don't you just say you're a producer? Or you're a songwriter, or you're a guitarist. Or that you get it, or that you get anxious, or you get distracted, or and who doesn't? You know, I think a lot of these things probably existed when we were all students too. Well, and we every just learn ADHD, how to cope. Every ADHD boy has no trouble spending five consecutive hours completely concentrating on his video game. Where was the <laughs> where was the distractibility? There was no distractibility. Give them something to do they want to do. ADHD vanishes. Hmm. Make them, make them sit in church or sit at the, the dining room table or listen to a teacher that they can't do. But at any rate, we're, yeah, we're off somewhere. <laughs> we're off in the weeds. <laughs> off in the weeds. Off in the weeds of. Uh... Well, that brings me to why smart people hurt. That was a fabulous book too. Uh, great. I'm glad you liked it, and thank you. And yes. <laughs> What's the why there? Many whys, of course. And the one thing that doesn't interest me is trying to define smart. Mm -hmm. that's, no. that's its own morass. Right. We've seen through IQ tests or what have you, and whatever we're talking about, whether it's one standard deviation above the mean or two standard deviations above the mean, whatever we're talking about, I let people self-identify as to what smart means. <laughs> but what are some of the challenges? Anti-intellectual culture, getting worse all the time. Being yeah. smart has never been okay, generally speaking. Is it, so you've always been, been the, the wise mouth kid or the off kid and put down by the much larger numbered ordinary kids. So being smart has never been okay culturally. <laughs> 
I think people who are smart pop out of the womb with a whole set of characteristics that make life hard. One is that they pop out stubborn, I believe. <laughs> they're already stubborn. And they look around and they're individualistic and they look at their parents and say, who are these people and what are they doing here? And, and why are they saying these things? And <laughs> they're already on their own journey. And because they're going to try to maintain their individuality against the pressure of family and culture, mm. they're going to be oppositional. They're going to be a little feisty or, or obedient, but inside not obedient. Depressed. <laughs> Depressed. Yeah. And so we have one kind of individual who is the repressed creative and another kind of individual who's the acting out creative. Yeah. So, and parenthetically, back around the time of the depression when Roosevelt started the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, there was money to do oddball studies that have never been replicated. And one of the interesting studies done back then in the 30s and 40s had to do with asking teachers to just try to distinguish between the intelligent kids in their classroom and the creative kids in their classroom. And of course, sometimes they may be the same person, mm. but, but sometimes they're not. No. And, and, and so it was interesting to discover what the, what the teachers, who the, who the teachers thought were kids in one and kids in the other, and then to see what distinguished them, what seemed to distinguish them. So the, intelligent but not creative kids wanted to know what was on the test creative kids <laughs> didn't care intelligent but not creative kids wanted to know what professions made money creative kids didn't care etc <laughs> they were they were different types they well, were actually different types yeah. and that's why if you get two smart people together that doesn't mean they're the same person at all because it might be no. smart and conventional and smart and creative and they they will be going in different directions in life. So there are all kinds of all kinds of challenges that come with smart. One is mm. for, um, certain kinds of researchers, academics, what have you, going down a rabbit hole and ending up just having to do work on one small area of a field, working with one worm or one amoeba or one one gene or one something. <laughs> when in ancient Greece you could be a natural philosopher and do big mm. work. And now we can't really do big work. We have to be a specialist. We have to go somewhere. That's the way our academic system propels us to go somewhere. Hmm. So many people in corners of their fields, completely bored and disappointed that that's where they've ended up, but with really no recourse because that's that's where their grants get their money, et cetera. So we're just, we're just touching on some of the issues that arise, but um, there's a whole set of difficulties that come with being smart. A title I came across yesterday was, and I, I just love this title, 30 Ways to Soothe Your Everyday Calm Inner Best. <laughs> That's to cover everything. Huh? <laughs> That's very good. That might be why, but it might be 10 Zen seconds or why smart people heard or something that has gone into Czech or Korean and has now come back into English. <laughs> now I now I don't recognize it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, as a creative yourself, what are some of the things you do to soothe yourself and to get back in the game or to feel on top of the world? What do you do to renew? Be with my wife. Um, I believe that intimacy and, and being with another human being matters. And um, we respect each other. Well, where are we at now? 46 years together or something like that. So that's a while. And uh, we enjoy each other's company. So that helps me. I like our rhythm of... So my workday starts at about 5 a.m. or thereabouts. And I try to go till about... 3 p.m. pretty much straight doing all the various things that I do. So I still have my 10 hour workday, but then I stop mm. and then we have our happy hour and we watch something or other. We like, um, you know, foreign films and independent films and those sorts of things that people like. Mm. So that's, we relax, say, say it simply, I relax. <laughs> yes. And, and then there are, there are home, people don't, there's lots to be said about energy. We, we don't understand human energy very well, chi or mm -hmm. life energy. And so we have those kinds of labels around mania and unproductive obsessions. We have certain kinds of labels, but they don't really get at what happens when our brain starts racing or when we send our brain racing, because often we do that work. We, mm. we 
we initiate the racing because we want to bite into some subject. And so we say, go brain, go. <laughs> but then it goes. And then we have to be the brakeman for that brain too, for that, <laughs> that racing or else it just goes. Well, that's a long winded way of saying one of the home remedies for racing brainness is taking a hot shower. There's some actual physiological component. There's some oh, electrolyte thing. So a hot shower helps me. And I think it helps many people calm down because of some electrolytic thing. So I have that's my awesome. practices and my, you know, making my, making my popcorn and, and <laughs> the, the I, thing yes. work. nothing, nothing very fancy, very, very ordinary <laughs> things, but uh, they work for me. <laughs> Do you like the butter on the popcorn? Or Absolutely popcorn not. Oil? Absolutely not. Always, coconut always, oil? always weight watching. No, no butter. Can't do it. No coconut oil? No coconut oil. Very, very plain. Yeah. Popped in plain. And a little salt? No, because I, I eat other salty things. We eat a lot of uh, Greek olives in various presentations. Yeah, so I get my olives salt. Are good. Very good. Greek olives are good. <laughs> all right, all right. So in those 10 hours, you're writing new books. Yeah, I, I work with perhaps 60 or 70 clients monthly. I meet only once a month, but oh, wow. I, have to, I, have to, I have to, and that's, I typically have 13 or 14 or 15 client days of four or five clients a day. So those are those days I'm doing that work. Um, I'm always working on books. Um, I train creativity coaches in, in 16 week trainings that go on continually throughout the year. Yes. Um, I create programs. I'm doing a million things. <laughs> I have a blog for psychology today called Rethinking Mental Health. It's had three or four million views. So I write for that blog post. Wow. And for other uh, blog entities too. I write a twice weekly blog for the, something called the Good Men Project. I do a variety of things, but um, I have... Uh, the way I say it to myself is I stay out of my own way. I can move from <laughs> most people can't transition through the day that easily, that fluid, fluently or fluidly from one thing to another. Hmm. They do the thing that maybe they have to criticize the thing they just do did or judge it or or they they go someplace that prevents them from just easily moving on to the next thing. Hmm. So that's one of my whatever skills or bits of luck is that I just can move on to the next thing without undramatically. That is cool. And because not, they could do that in a school day. You know, you would take several different classes and shift right. gears and have to change subjects. And yeah, that's right. Flawless German transmission system. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you can probably trace that back to loving popcorn, I think. I, I think that's right. That's, right. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> I used to feel like my brain would eat itself if I didn't give it something to do. Because yep. it wants to crunch on something all the time. That's exactly right. And so uh, it, it's interesting. Leonard Wolf, Virginia Wolf's husband, said of her, and as we know, she had big racing brain episodes. I'm not going to call it mania, which is what, of course, it is called. Hmm. She had mild racing brain episodes. And then he said three major racing brain episodes, one of which probably provoked the suicide that she just she 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 was she lost the ability in my language to mediate that mania mediate that energy mm -hmm. and and for for people who go over an edge or have trouble dealing with their racing brain energy that's the work they have to learn to do they they can absolutely take chemicals for it people can be tranquilized you can take chemicals for it but that's not the right answer for no. Dealing with race, with dealing with energy, the the answer for dealing with energy is not to uh, find a drill that find a drug that will work as a tranquilizer. Right. It's the same with uh, performance anxiety uh, for a lot of folks. Uh, the extra adrenaline, they just have to learn yeah. how to 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 ride that extra adrenaline and practice with the adrenaline. So I'm often telling folks like imagine you're performing at the place that you're concerned about, you know, yep. like stand up, do exactly what you're going to do. Maybe even wear what you're going to wear, set up the gear, go through all the motions. Right. The play the front the whole performance. By the way, just imagine to... it, imagine yeah. it so that, so that right. you put yourself there because the brain doesn't know the difference between something actually happening and just your imagination, your, your nervous system reacts the same way. That's right. And to piggyback on that, 
I keep reminding perform, perform, performing artist clients that one of the great danger moments for a lot of performers is when they come off the stage late at night. Because mm. now they've flooded their system with adrenaline by, mm -hmm. by performing. And now they have all of this excess adrenaline going through the system and, and somebody can tell them, well, just go to bed. They, they, they can't just go to bed. And this is when the heavy drinking happens and the drugs happen and, and the sex happens and this happens and that happens because they they can't just come down by snapping their fingers. They they need their methods, their methodology mm -hmm. for coming down with all of that adrenaline coursing through their system after a performance. They need to they need to figure out their ceremonies or rituals or tactics or whatever exactly. so that they don't have to just go with the other folks to the bar, but they have some other they have some other way to to deal with all of that energy. Right. Right. What haven't we covered? Everything. <laughs> we, can, we, can, we can call it a moment. We can say we've done it. <laughs> it's so good. So good. You've, your, your work has just helped so many people. And it always amazes me when I connect once with someone's work, whether it's a song or a movie or a book or helpful understanding in psychology, because your work lasted and even you persevered enough that your work even reached me. Yep. You know, like that that is exciting to me you know so you are my you are my audience of one i don't know if you're <laughs> familiar with that phrase but the avant-garde artists of the turn of the last century the picassos and brocks used that phrase the audience of one to do, <laughs> maybe nobody will understand what i'm doing maybe one person will now of course they were grandiose arrogant guys and they they wanted an audience of a billion but still <laughs> i like that phrase an audience of one that it matters to me that a person gets reached <laughs> a friend I play with, we always say we're sharing the same fan. <laughs> they buy go. everything we we put out. It's like that sounds like a horror that. movie, though. Where you have to <laughs> put, put off an arm and cut you know. <laughs> right. or, or our one fan. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. You're very Eric, welcome, it's Eric. Great, you're great a true, true, awesome writer and uh, fantastic organizer of thoughts and. Like a lot of people feel all these things, but they can't express them and they can't put them into words. And so we're very thankful to you being so dedicated to show up every day, put in your 10 hours <laughs> and give us the words to understand what's going on in here. <laughs> well, thank you for having me and uh, great being here. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye-bye, Eric.